Hi, I'm your host, Marsha Florence, for Just Dance Talk Show. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it's part two of the Caregivers on the Frontline Public Forum. I hope you enjoyed the first half, and I know you'll enjoy part two. So sit back, get your pen and paper out, take notes, and enjoy the second half. Okay, next, I want to introduce someone who's doing her best to tackle some of these issues. Paula Duran, whose work as the Director of Universal Dementia Caregivers was featured in a profile that Ted wrote for Bridge Michigan, joins us now. Welcome, Paula. Thank you very much, glad to be here. Mm -hmm. So what led you to this passionate interest in the well-being of caregivers? Well, I cared for both of my parents. My mom had Alzheimer's and dad had vascular dementia. And as a result of that, it's one of those things that it became my role. And I think what happens with a lot of caregivers, family caregivers, is that it's an automatic move. It's like you initially start doing little things, you initially start getting engaged with them, doing things for them, then all of a sudden you're doing pretty much everything. It becomes a 24-7 job for you. Mm -hmm. And in that process of going through that journey, and I want you to know how amazing it was, but how amazing it was. <laughs> so it was just awful on one side because there were days you had no time for yourself. And there, and with them having dementia, there were moments where you felt like you didn't even know what to do. It brings about a helplessness. And you know, us independent people, we don't want to feel helpless, <laughs> but there's so many gifts in the caregiving process and the joy of being, of honoring them and, and sacrificing with them and walking the last journey. I think you said uh, it, it's, it's really something special. And I view it as a gift to be a caregiver mm -hmm. and not everybody can do it. And so that's why it's so important to me that I became an advocate, a trainer of design programs. Uh, we speak on the issue. Uh, I'm a psychologist by training. And Stephen, sometimes you think you're smart because of your credentials. <laughs> this disease, these diseases will bring you to your knees mm -hmm. because it's sometimes you just become, you don't know what to do. And at those moments, you start inter becoming inside, seeing what you can do, learn as much as you can, and connect and partner with others. So yeah. I was excited when Ted contacted me about sharing the stories around caregivers. Yeah. So tell us more about Universal Dementia Caregivers, how it came about, and how you work with caregivers to help them succeed. Thank you for that. I love talking about Universal. Mm -hmm. Universal Dementia came about because I kept a journal as I was working with my parents. And I had this wonderful idea that this journal was gonna be so good, I'm gonna write it and I'm gonna publish it. And I'm just educate the whole world about caregiving. And when I started it and I opened it up at, at one point and I said, oh my God, this is sad. I'm angry, <laughs> I'm frustrated. And I have captured all of this anger and frustration in this document. But I wanted, I said, but I think sometimes there are things you go through that are for you. And then I think there are things you go through are for the better good. And so this, that was my experience. I believe it was for the better good. My first document and training program I put out there was called My Lights Are Going Out, But It's Not Dark In Here. Hmm. Came to really appreciate the spiritual part of care. Caring is so much more than giving a bath or the task at hand of which are essential, but it's also part of nurturing the person and you growing and learning together and understanding you're on the journey together and your lights kind of parallel each other for quite some time. So I designed the program and in designing, I started, uh, I have a board and my board said, go prove that you can do this. Mm. And so one of my board members gave us money, donated money and said, prove it. So I got out and I just put my, my sign up basically. <laughs> and we have a, we do a full day uh, boot camp. And our boot camp is outstanding. Uh, and, and we do this where we teach you the on a, the program we design that's currently used through Wayne State and a number of other different organizations uh, that, that, and we're also going for a number of other recognitions for the program. But in the process, you learn about you first because you need to know, can I do this work? Because not everybody can do this work. Uh, especially when you start to talk about dementia, people struggle with the fact that they don't remember my name or they may start cursing at me and they've never cursed at me before in their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and you can bring that. And so we've got very common experiences, but not the same experiences. So we offer a boot camp, which is a full day, and you have to be a current unpaid caregiver. We want to be in the room together so that what you do, you can and learn and experience, you can actually go utilize that knowledge the next day. Mm -hmm. And then we normally do a 30-day follow-up. 
So we cover, I'm a caregiver, what it, what it means to be a caregiver, all of the issues and challenges around caregiving. We understand ourselves. We talk about dementia in particular disease and what to expect and the experiences. We talk about walking the last journey with someone because our loved ones are going to die at some point. And we need to be able to have that conversation. So we offer that training. We also offer monthly lunch and learn sessions and uh, Triumph Church has been so kind to me. Uh, Triumph Church allows us to give, to do our monthly lunch and learns there. So we're partially virtual right now and partially in person. And so once a month, we do a lunch and learn on a re topic related to caregivers that's relevant. Uh, a, a, a helpful plug, the 29th of September, we're doing one. Um, mm -hmm. So then in addition to that, we do online. We do a support group online because not everybody's comfortable yet coming into a closed space. Uh, so we do the support group. And uh, interesting today, we had a woman in our group, first time at the group. And what she said was, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And there were caregivers online that just loved on her, that cared for her, that appreciated her, that understood her. Um, so we would do that. And we do an exercise program online because something someone said earlier, self-care is you've got to care for yourself. You can become so consumed with making sure that your loved one gets to the doctor, then you forget you need to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. You're preparing this wonderful meal for, for your loved one and you eat whatever's left. Too many caregivers die before the loved one they're serving. So those are the kinds of things. We also will do family mediation discussions. So people will call us in when the family's in conflict um, in order to work through some issues so that it's all focused on the loved one mm -hmm. with living with dementia. So those are some of the services and how we got there. So I wonder, uh, since you've been doing this, if there are some needs that you've identified as more common or more critical for caregivers uh, than others, what, what is it that you're learning, I guess, about what caregivers need uh, through Universal? And we've been capturing this data. Um, what we found is that number one, people need to, well, skip the numbers. The person needs to have the right documents mm -hmm. to be able to serve. Mm -hmm. So because I'm a family caregiver, I never think about the fact that I might have need a power of attorney or I might need, a, the will needs to be established or my loved one doesn't have any documents that tell me anything about how they wanna be cared for. So that's a big one. And one of the things we do is we invite attorneys in to talk about that stuff so people can ask their questions. Uh, another common one is people become so selfless that we have to boost them up to say, you matter. If you're not alive to take care of your caregiver, your, mom, your loved one, your mom, your dad, your sibling, who's going to do it? Because the work is, is, is overwhelming. It's a 24 seven experience that you have to learn to manage yourself. Mm -hmm. So in addition to self-care, the legal stuff, people need to learn how, the big, big issue, self-manage. That is, we think we can control the world. We think we can make somebody do something. We think we're going to tell our parent what to do and they just going to jump and do it. First of all, even if they don't have dementia, they don't want you trying to tell them what to do. <laughs> Teaching them how to engage a loved one living with disease of any kind is essential. But honoring them enough to work with them and move and have, that con have the conversations ongoing are very important. So that piece of understanding your loved one and the needs of your loved one are essential. Caregivers need to also feel empowered. They don't realize sometimes that when they go take their loved one to the doctor, you're the best advocate for them. But somehow we get into these doctor settings, and I put doctors in quotes, and we think that they, they are all knowing. I'm there with the person 24 seven. I see some things, I may not know what it means. It is essential that I, I become a voice. And so sometimes you just have to encourage people that you are valued, you are important, you need to feel empowered. And I even, we even train them to say, here's some key questions to ask the doctor. If you don't really feel comfortable, just pull out the list and say, Dr. Darren said I should ask these questions. Mm -hmm. So you get started engaging and learning more about the person. Now I could go on and on, but also the other thing is skill, sometimes skill, we need skills, but more than skills, we need passion. Mm -hmm. We need compassion. We need to be able to connect to the heart. Uh, we've designed a tool, it's called Flowers, and it teaches you how to touch the heart, the spirit, and the mind of the person. Because sometimes the words don't come out, 
They don't express them the way we're comfortable with expressing them. It is really essential that we start really thinking about how do I connect with Paula in a way that I truly understand her needs. And my goal is to ensure that she that we meet them, but I stay healthy in the process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paula and Ted and Sarah for joining us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our next panelist is George Pitchford. Like Paula and like Larry McLemore from our earlier video, George took care of a loved one for years. George, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. So tell us how you became your wife's caregiver. So my wife uh, of 52 years, na her name was Betty. Uh, she uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in uh, uh, 2013, and uh, over the course of the next five, six, seven years, well, she passed in 2020. Over the course of the next uh, five or six years, she got progressively worse. Mm -hmm. uh, part of this time, we had professional persons coming in, uh, caregivers uh, coming in, and in 2018, uh, she was placed in a nursing home. And uh, of course that uh, I, I went to see her every day with the exception of about two days for a year and a half. Then of course the pandemic hit and uh, we, I could not go to, go to see her, but that was sort of the course. And uh, if I could mention, you know, one of the things that made this so traumatic, I'd like to just add a little context here. My wife was really a spirited person and to watch her morph from a person who was uh, director of special ed in the Pontiac uh, education school system mm. and who had was a trained clown, uh, was a person who taught quilting and sewing, who engaged in calligraphy and was an avid reader to watch her over that course of, uh, of that period of time, just drift into a person that uh, barely knew me was quite traumatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry about uh, about all of that. Um, but it sounds like uh, over time, even though it might have taken a while, you figured out how to navigate the system and to make sure that your wife was getting the services uh, that she needed. Can you tell us about that process of getting to the place where you felt like she was well taken care of? Well, first thing, as I'm listening to the panelists tonight, I wish I had known about uh, Mr. Tifford and Ms. Uh, Coleman Betts uh, beforehand, mm -hmm. because it was quite a laborious task to navigate through this if you are not uh, up on how the system really works. And I wasn't. Uh, I first went to a neurologist who made the diagnosis in 2013. And this may sound unbelievable, but perhaps some of the, the professionals know about this, but the neurologist had no idea mm -hmm. where to direct me to. And so I sort of did by happenstance, started asking people and looking on the internet, came upon the Alzheimer's Association and, and did finally get in touch with support groups and that kind of thing. But uh, it was a difficult path getting to that point. But I did start to uh, get into this, this a little, little bit better as I became uh, familiar with the disease itself that was through books. But I, I have nothing but praise for the Alzheimer's Association and their support groups because I learned so much about it. And I was listening to Dr. Duren. And uh, well, let me tell you, she's dead on point there, how I had to learn to get into my wife's space because she no longer could come to mine. Mm -hmm. And I figured out real early in the game that uh, if there's gonna be any peace and if I can be of any help to her, I'm gonna have to uh, go to her where she is because she was no longer able to, to come up to where I was. In other words, I, I, a little affirmation I, I always use, never try to infuse logic into a situation that's not based on logic, that logic is out the door. And so, you know, it was nothing short of a blessing 
to come upon uh, the support groups that sort of walked me through the fact that, okay, you can forget the person that used to be there and you have to learn to deflect and to uh, not make a big thing out of uh, some of the things that she's gonna say and some of the things she's gonna do. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, that period of adjustment and just kind of reframing, I think, uh, the entire way you think of the relationship you have uh, with this person uh, is, a, is a really critical part of, uh, of adjusting to that, that caregiver role. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so what are some of the big takeaways that you discovered that you would want to share with fellow caregivers? What are some of the things you know now that you would say to somebody who's at the beginning of this process? Well, you know, I could <laughs> refer them to groups that I didn't know about. That would be the first thing. But you know, something that's a touch spiritual to me, I came across the other day. And uh, as Dr. Duran also was saying, uh, this is something a little bit greater than just the day to day. I take care of you and hope that you get through the day. There's something a little bit deeper than that. And I think this is uh, this little thing I came across that I wrote shortly after she passed, which said, uh, work to build good thoughts and memories. Mm. It's almost inevitable that one soulmate will lead the other one mm. with just thoughts and memories. And so that's something that's down the road and it not, may not be right directly to the question you're asking. But man, does that help out to... Uh, know that you have lived the kind of life where uh, you can feel that you did all you could for her and that you can uh, think back on all the good times that you had. Mm. And it's almost like Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. You really need to start working on that right now because if you're a couple, almost in, in, invariably, one of you will leave before the other one. Yeah. But some of the real things are some of the things that have mentioned takeaways would be, you know, just skip short circuit some of the uh, stuff that uh, you hear. I, I, again, the neurologist was telling me about head injuries and whatnot, and why don't you go to a support group of that kind? And, and boy, I, I, there's a disconnect in there somewhere. Mm. The Alzheimer's Association and all these groups here, I would want folks to go to the area ages, agency on aging and some of these places to get some real good information on uh, some steps that you can take to uh, uh, address your needs. Yeah. So my last question to you is about uh, what life is like now. And I think that's something we don't necessarily always think about is that uh, this experience of giving care to somebody and then having to let that person go um, doesn't necessarily end the needs for the for the caregiver. In some ways, I would imagine it, it just begins them. Um, tell us how you're doing and how you're finding support or relief now. So the Bangladeshi community is not new to the Michigan, uh, you know, state. However, the what I found in my reporting is that overall language is the biggest issue when it comes to accessing healthcare even in 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. And so although people have been here for a long time, there's always going to be an element of caregiving um, in families because a lot of families live in intergenerational homes. And that means that children are often not only helping their parents who might not speak English very well, but also their grandparents. And sometimes that role is um, put on to women who are taking care of both aging parents and their um, younger kids. So during the pandemic, we saw that um, the biggest issue was not having available resources in Bangla. And when they were available, they were available in a different dialect than the most spoken in the Michigan area, which is the Siliti dialect. And so it was very difficult for people to have real-time information. As we know, the CDC put out information uh, you know, as soon as it was available, but it wasn't always translated just as quickly. So in the absence of that, uh, people relied on asking family members for information, WhatsApp groups, um, Facebook posts, and had to really hash out what made sense, what to believe, and um, how to trust that information. 
So uh, the pandemic, of course, presented additional problems when it came to delivering this adequate health care. Uh, what solutions do people come up uh, to serve and safeguard seniors in uh, that Bangladeshi community? Well, at first, um, I saw that a lot of people were creating videos and uh, having conversations with people and posting those on Facebook. So when it came from offices like doctor's offices and nurse practitioners, you know, there are more trusted sources that the community could rely on. At the same time, um, you know, people were, there was, a, there was a problem that came up in the Hamtramck Detroit area where a lot of the regular PCPs were closed, right, during the pandemic. And essentially people were just being routed either to the hospital if they thought they had COVID or sent to spaces where they might be able to get screened. And um, one of the local uh, doctor's offices, which actually takes care of children, their children's clinic of Michigan, um, they st started seeing an influx of Bangladeshi women coming to that clinic just for regular care, but also to get information about COVID. They just wanted a trusted face and someone they can speak to, to learn more about the pandemic and, um, and, and COVID-19 and how to protect themselves. And so we saw that women were taking initiative and people were taking initiative to get that information, even though it wasn't readily available. But also uh, we saw that you know community uh, community organizers and leaders were um, trying essentially to come up with some other alternatives to get this information out there. Traditionally, before COVID-19, people usually go to the mosque or the restaurant to understand new information. Mm -hmm. So that information would trickle down from usually the men um, and then back into their families. But because of everything being closed down for such a long time, it was hard for that information to get around as quickly as usual. So, uh, you know, people like uh, uh, groups in New York, there was two groups, there was Saki, and there was another organization uh, called LAL, which means red in Bangla. Uh, they started doing wellness check uh, checkups on people that they already were working with for things like ESL classes or citizenship classes, and started asking people what were they in need of during the pandemic. So not only did they find that people needed just basic information, but there were other issues coming up like food insecurity. Um, and then they tried to uh, service those people with information as much as possible, kind of as a package deal type of thing, and also provide funding for people who might need a, need caregiving or provide caregiving if they happen to con contract COVID-19 or someone in their family did so they can space themselves in those intergenerational homes. Hmm. So, Serena, uh, what do you think this story tells us? about the needs of non-predominantly English-speaking communities in Metro Detroit. Of course, the Bangla community is just one of those communities. This is a really diverse community. Lots of languages spoken here. Uh, this seems like a problem that could be pretty widespread. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, to be clear, you know, uh, Metro Detroit is home to the third largest Bangladeshi community um, in the country. Um, trailing only uh, DC and New York. And so, um, and yet there's really a dearth of reliable news information um, available in, in Bangla um, and catered or focused to the community. And so that, that was one of the reasons um, why I, you know, commissioned the story to Nargis. She had received a fellowship to cover issues around aging and it just made personal perfect sense because if we as like an alternative um, people or community of color focused publication, if we're not able to um, provide this information, who will? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty widespread. I mean, looking, looking at language barriers across the board, Spanish speaking community is is very similar um, and and you see the issue blow up in all areas, whether it's caregiving. Um, the coronavirus, um, you know the elections um, mask wearing um, getting vaccines, a lot of communities will turn to uh, like Narga said um, whatsapp or Facebook or TikTok, all these like alternative media platforms and as soon as they see a piece of information that resonates with them uh 
or that kind of reinforces what they already believe, then they just kind of run with it. Um, I think, I think in terms of solutions, you know, we talk about, well, what can we do to kind of address this? We did look at New York, as Nargis had mentioned, and, um, and looked at how the infrastructure and some of these social service organizations is maybe a few years farther along than it is here in Detroit, mm -hmm. um, but it's something that we can draw from. I, I would also say that, um, you know, looking outside of, a particular language, but looking at what Spanish language populations are doing or look at what Arabic language populations are doing to care for the needs of, um, of, of their elders is, is another way to kind of, you know, pick up on some of the, some of the similarities. Obviously every um, ethnicity, nationality, race is going to have their own unique uh, challenges, but, um, but there is definitely something to be learned within the different communities. So, and I, and I thought that was important, again, looking at, um, you know, just a little background about Tostada Magazine, you know, we really focus on um, looking at the communities that, that make Metro Detroit what it is, um, and communities that don't necessarily get a lot of um, kind of representation um, in popular media and and um, and providing that that resource. Okay, Serena and Nargis, thanks for uh, joining us here on the program. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank uh, the other journalists and our other guests for their valuable insights and uh, all that they contributed to this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a chance to enjoy part two of three part series. Tune in next week to part three of the Caregivers on the Frontline Public Forum. I'm your host, Marsha Florence from Just Ask, and what do I always say? If you know a person with a disability or if you just have a general question, don't be afraid to ask, just ask. I'm your host. See you next time.